So we're going to go to the beginning of your career. Now, you're a high school teacher as a very young man. Where There's sort of almost a disconnect between you, you know, going for a conventional uh, job in education to deciding, you know what, I'm going to make it into pro wrestling. What was the transition from that? Well, my grandmother and grandfather were, were big wrestling fans. We lived in Pitt, outside of Pittsburgh, about 30 miles south of Pittsburgh. And, of course, Bruno was the, the icon at that time. And uh, my grandmother and grandfather watched wrestling on television, so I started watching it. And uh, I just thought, well, I'm going to try this. What if I don't try it? At least if I do, if I try it and don't fail, uh, fail, I said, well, I could have done this or that. But if I don't try it at all, I'll have this what if in my brain all the time. So try it out. Guido Mongo was the promoter at the time of uh, uh, the Pittsburgh Territory. He just bought it from Bruno. And uh, Larry Zabisco was trained by Guido. I was trained by Guido. Uh, everybody wants to think, give credit to Bruno, but uh, Larry was trained by Guido as well. So a good friend of mine uh, who played ball with me, uh, we tried out, liked it. Six months later, we're in the ring. <laughs> so but it was such a just close, by accident. Well, it was just such a close shop at that time. So how do you sort of introduce yourself saying, I'm so-and-so, I want to become a wrestler and not get like, left uh, out of the room? Just be brazen. Just, hey, what are you going to do? Say no? If you say no, at least I tried. And it was closed. It was a closed fraternity. Uh, and I guess I was fortunate. Uh, right place at the right time. Uh, Guido and Bolo, I mean, Guido and Beppo uh, uh, were traveling. And uh, Nikita Koloff, or Vol was it Volkov? Nikita. Anyway, Nikita. Um, Nikolai, Nikolai, Nikolai Volkov, Volkov. That's yeah. what it was. Nikolai Volkov was Guido's original partner. And after we got trained, they were in Louisiana, and Nikolai had an accident and ruptured his spleen. So he had to take some time off. So they were scheduled to go to Japan. So Guido calls me and said, you want to go to Japan? I said, I guess. So here I am. I'm really green. Don't know much. He's in my ear all the way on the plane from Pittsburgh to to Tokyo, telling me how the uh, how it is in Japan, how rough they are, how stiff they are. And I got off that damn plane. I could have gone through, walked through the walls. And for about the first week of a eight week tour, I was beating the shit out of people. <laughs> and uh, Inoki comes over to me one night and he says, "Hey, Bill, loosen up a little bit." But in the long run, it, it served me well because nobody was picking on me. And I watched other guys, young guys, they got picked on. And here I was, this stiff guy beating up everybody. So they figured, well, I better stay away from him. And I was 300 pounds at the time, so in pretty good shape. I hear quite a lot of stories about Japan when someone brand new, Gaijin, goes over. They're in their first match. That's the test oh, match. Boy. They will... In fact, you've already got a story, I know. So the very first match and the and someone's looking to test you, surely? Oh, yeah, yeah. I mean, and you don't realize it, and I wouldn't have realized it, but if if I wouldn't have got the pep talk on the way over. Because the, the only way that the, the young boys can move up the ladder is to take advantage of somebody. And I saw, in all my years over there, I saw a lot of young guys have miserable trips. You know, so... You set the stage that first, that first couple of days if you're going to make it or not make it. So to have the office come and say, "Loosen up," I knew I was in good shape. <laughs> uh, the first trip over, and I've I've been to Japan once, and it's just it's an amazing country, and I'm going again next year as well. Talk about the culture shock of a right because I mean you're you're a, you've been a huge star in Japan for twenty years. Or the you know working main events for you know New Japan and uh, yeah. beyond, but the very first time you went the culture shock. Oh, I loved it from the first trip. I mean, of course, I was in awe of all the the, the just the travel effect of going over there and and the uh, experience and it. But uh, the people are 
very polite, honest. Uh, I love the food. I, I enjoy, I'm a history teacher, so I enjoyed the aesthetic value of the history. Uh, first class operation, Inoki's group, New Japan was, uh, everything was first class. First class travel, first class hotels. They take you out to, uh, two or three times a week to eat. So the, you, you know the money you're going to make. There's no, once you make the deal, you don't have to worry about it. So mm. I have nothing but positive about being over in Japan. What was your reaction to the first time you were handed like a dried squid that looked like it had been ironed? And you said, <laughs> there you go, have that. Well, you get that in the convenience stores or the or the, uh, the 7-Elevens at that time. But, uh, you know, it's get you get used to it. But I, I like to experiment with food any, anyway. So, mm. you know, I, I can go from steaks to snakes. So it doesn't matter. <laughs> Uh, talk about if you would uh, the Yakuza and their involvement in wrestling and when you started learning that at some point somewhere the local mafia was involved in pro wrestling and why they were in pro wrestling well I didn't realize it until a few tours later uh, and then I witnessed it one time when there was like a a semi blockade of the television production because I guess some payments weren't made. So all the people, instead of being in the arena were held outside until I guess some kind of a transaction was made. And then you notice uh, a lot of the seats around ringside are taken up by uh, uh, certain individuals. But I was used to that in the States. I mean, my, uh, I, I'm familiar with it in the States. Mm. It was um, Shane Douglas, when I was interviewing him, he always says, uh, the guys whose noses look like that. And you can always... Not start. always. Yeah, not <laughs> always. I mean, there, there are some uh, traditional-looking individuals. Mm. I, I speak from from personal, from personal knowledge <laughs> on that. I can't divulge. I don't want to get... I don't want to get people on my hey, on my shoulder. That's fine. There's no such thing as a mafia. That's what I hear anyway. No, there isn't. No, uh, one it's, a, it's a fraternity. Yeah. One more thing about uh, Japan is the sponsor culture. I'm always really fascinated by. When did you first start getting sponsors? The first trip. Uh, what? And it's nice because uh, you get to go out. But it, it's funny sometimes. Uh, when we were first over there as the Mongols, and as as I developed and, and became more popular uh, as a superstar, say, for example, Andre and I would be on a tour together, and uh, we'd go out, they'd take you out to dinner. and um, But you're going to like the 15 clubs in, the, in an evening. So you might have a drink or two at one club, and then they're scooting you around to the next club, and then the next club, and then you have a a bowl of soup and a, a salad. And then pretty soon it, it takes about seven or eight clubs before you finally get your complete meal. <laughs> but each one of those clubs are, are being contributing to the, the financial aspect. Hmm. Where, where do these people come from? Were they always fans? Were they always what we, the people that don't exist? Yeah. They're, they're, they're paying tribute to a, like an insurance company. <laughs> but, well, you can never be protected enough, can you? Um, That's right. I'm going to go away from Japan. Oh, I'm sorry. No, there's something else that someone wants to know about Japan. Uh, please, uh, Smog UK uh, pl says, please ask Bill about the pay differences between Inoki and Baba. I really don't know the differences because I only work for Inoki. Uh, I was approached one time to jump from New Japan to All Japan, New Japan being Inoki to Baba. But like I said before, Inoki treated me well. I mean, there was first-class treatment. Every time I'd go to Japan, I would go from Japan and I'd stop off. I'd have my wife fly and my daughter fly to Hawaii and meet me so we'd have a little vacation. Say, for example, we were in 
Japan for four weeks instead of coming and then home for two and then back for four. Instead of going home, I'd have my wife and daughter meet me in Japan or in Hawaii. Well, almost every trip, Inoki would say, where you go? I said, well, I'm going to go to Hawaii for a little bit. And he'd say, oh, great. So when they pay you at the end of the trip, your tour, they want you to count the money. And after about two or three trips, I said, I trust you. Don't worry. But he said, no, no, you count. And all the advances that you took are subtracted. Well, they didn't take any advances out. This was the first time. I said, well, you paid me too much. He says, no, no, have a good trip in Hawaii. And so they paid for the Hawaii trip. And they did that every time. So then I got approached to jump from Inoki to Bubba, and I told the guy, I said, why would I do that? One, my slot will be further down, and two, these guys are great to me. I'm like, what am I going to do? Uh, tell them that they're the shits and, <laughs> you know, the treatment I got was bad. So they treated me with first class, and I honored them. And he found out about it, and he appreciated it. But I didn't do it for that. I just did it because, I mean, I was loyal to it. With that being said, let's say, if, uh, you know, if it's purely business and there was no loyalty towards Inoki in particular, was Baba's offer to you worth considering? Uh, it wasn't much more, considering the fact that, uh, you know, there's there's five guys now that went. So now instead of the top two or three guys, you're number seven or six. Uh, and I was making good enough money that I didn't have to worry about it. And I was going, I could, the nice thing that I had about Japan during the Christmas break, they'd send me the whole next year's schedule and said, you pick when you want to come. So I could go 12 weeks. I could go, they ran 20 weeks a year. They wanted me to come at least 12. I could go over a week. You know, sometimes Hogan be there for a week. I'd be there a week. Andre would be there a week out of a four-week tour. Um, and some tours they wanted me to be on, like the the tag team tour or the Madison Square Garden singles tournament. So where else are you going to get that? You get to pick your times. and Then I could set up my trips to Hawaii, and I could set up my other tours where I was going to go to Montreal or Georgia or Florida or it was nice. Mm. Were promoters back in the States all understanding that they wouldn't be getting you full, full, full time? You know, you would be going here, there, and everywhere. I don't know if they knew that, but, I mean, part of the – it's like we do now. Uh, we're, we're still fortunate. We're booked. We book two weekends a month. Uh, and then we, because if we book more than that, it's like being on the road again. So once we book those two weekends, uh, then we don't take any booking, say for January or February. Mm -hmm. And we're fortunate enough, we're already into next August. Mm -hmm. So yeah, Barb's here too. He's, he's a good friend. We were up in the Hamilton Comic Con last weekend and uh, all four of us were there. It's nice because a lot of people want to take, uh, take the time to take a photo with all four of us, which is pretty unique. Mm. Yeah, I, I've actually interviewed Barbarian before, and um, in fact, because Chris arranged it as well. And uh, I've told everyone since, Gee, what a sweetheart that dude is. Oh, yeah. Well, he can be. He can be the other side too, but you'd have to be, you'd have to be a butthead to get him pissed off. 